Ladies and gentlemen, my next guest is a diplomat who has spent 40 years working in the government. She now serves as the United States Ambassador to the United Nations. Please welcome Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for being here. Thank you. Friday was the one-year anniversary of uh, Putin's invasion of Ukraine. You were in the Security Council, in the Security Council meeting when that invasion actually happened. Looking back over the last year, are you surprised where we are or where things are in Ukraine, given how uh, perilous the situation looked in those first weeks? Well, I, I have to tell you, that day was surreal. Uh, we called an emergency meeting of the council mm -hmm. so that we could warn the world that Russia was planning to invade Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And they did it while we were sitting in the council. And so I think even the Russians who were, pre they were president of the council, so their ambassador was sitting in the chair. Mm -hmm. And as we all looked at our phones and heard uh, that this was happening, and at the time, Russia said, this is just going to be a two-week operation. We'll finish it off. And here we are one year later, and they were, so mis uh, they were so misguided, they were so mistaken, because one year later, Ukraine still stands. And President Biden was there at the one-year mark, mm -hmm. congratulating President Zelensky for the fortitude that the Ukrainians have shown and showed the Ukrainians that the world still stands united with Ukraine. What, what's it like? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's it like to be in the room with the Russian ambassador then or now? Do you ever go over and say, come on, what are you guys thinking? Do you, ever, do you ever get to shoot straight with these guys? Uh, occasionally, we have the opportunity to shoot straight. But things have changed since uh, the invasion uh, of Ukraine. Uh, we have to work together. We sit around the table with each other every day, 15 countries, the five permanent members and 10 elected members. Mm -hmm. And we have to engage on any number of issues. Uh, we engage on issues where we actually agree. We agreed on, on sanctions against Haitian gangs. Uh, we agreed on continuing to keep the border open uh, into Syria uh, a year ago so that humanitarian assistance could continue to go in to people at need, in need. But after the Ukrainian war, Russia really, uh, really disrespected the, the council and everything we stand for because they sit as permanent members of the council and they attack their neighbor. They brought this unprovoked war on the Ukrainian people. They're committing war crimes. They're committing crimes against humanity. They are committing human rights violations right in front of our eyes, and they're a permanent member of the council. Meaning so that it's they have changed. a veto. They have veto they power. They have veto power. And it is for that reason that we take our actions to the General Assembly, where their veto power doesn't, uh, doesn't work. And we have condemned them roundly on Friday, we put forward a resolution, a peace resolution, and 40, 141 countries voted for that resolution. So let's talk about China for just a moment, because there, it's been reported that China is considering sending uh, uh, weaponry and aid to Russia. And uh, Antony Blinken and Jake Sullivan have said, yeah, you, that's bad. You can't do that. Why would it be particularly bad for China to do that beyond prolonging the war? Well, first, it will prolong the war. But second, it means China will align itself with Russia's actions in Ukraine. China would align itself with committing human rights violations against the Ukrainian people, carrying out a bloody war uh, that uh, has really destroyed infrastructure in Ukraine. Uh, this is about supporting the UN Charter. And if China aligns itself with Russia, then it becomes part of that problem. So we've not seen any evidence yet that they have made a decision to, uh, to provide lethal weapons. 
Uh, but they understand very clearly if they do provide le lethal weapons that they are uh, supporting uh, Russia in its efforts to destroy a sovereign country. Now, obviously, things can get tense in any diplomatic situation. It's part of your job as an ambassador to try to de-escalate in many ways. That's the, that's the goal. Diplomacy is the Department of Peace. How I understand you've got a very interesting form of diplomacy that you use to try to win people over, not only for yourself, but for the states. <laughs> I assume you're talking about gumbo diplomacy. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't know exactly what that meant. That's why yes. I was letting you. What uh, is gumbo diplomacy? It's uh, anybody in the audience from Louisiana? <laughs> so gumbo diplomacy is about making gumbo, which is an extraordinary dish, uh, and having conversations with people over a great meal. And I cook it myself. Mm. Uh, I shared my recipe that I made up on the spot uh, with the Washington Post. Mm -hmm. I've never used the recipe myself. <laughs> and did you give them the real recipe or just what people who aren't from Louisiana are allowed to have? I I Because I, gave... I went down, when John Baptiste, I went down to cook with his mom, and he said to me afterwards, that's not the recipe she gave me. <laughs> People who cook uh, gumbo, we don't use a recipe. You just cook. Mm -hmm. And so I cook, and I actually try to reconstruct what I do in that recipe. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was in Ghana a few months ago, and the ambassador there had her chef use the recipe, and the gumbo was really good. So now I have to, <laughs> I have to try the recipe. Uh, it was better than anything I've ever made before. <laughs> How did you, after 40, after 40 years of working in diplomacy, I'm sure it can be disheartening sometimes when you see the state of the world. What are the moments that sustain you through uh, moments of doubt, let's say? You know, it's rare that I have moments of doubt because I know what we're doing is important. Uh, but one of the moments I had that really brought to the forefront what why what I do is so important. Some years ago, I met a young Sudanese uh, uh, man, a South Sudanese man on the streets in Arlington, Virginia. And he said, hey, Linda, you helped me get refugee status to the United States. And I realized at that moment that something I did had changed somebody's life. And so I approach my work every single day that I'm doing something that is going to change somebody's life. I may never meet the person, I may never hear what I've done, but I know in my heart that I'm doing something that is going to make a difference to people. And for that reason, I can get up every day and deal with the crap and fight uh, the, the good battle. Ambassador, thank you for being here. Thank you. Lovely to see you again. Thank you. Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield, everybody. We'll be right back.